is the question. And you guys, I am also an MBA, trained standard MBA, you know, B.Tech MBA. Many of you will be the standard B.Com, B.Tech MBA. You will soon become a BBA MBA, the, the, like a hardcore breed of managers. But then one has to question that why is it that what we are able to deliver as a product or a service in a corporate world does not reach as a service in the welfare world, in the development world, in the sustainability world. Why? We have to draw lessons from one sector to another. And that's what's, what we've been doing. So that's the model of providing Pura. Pura reaches about, as I told you, 10,000 villages. This is exactly what, it's, it's cross-learning. So I'm going to show you some gruesome video, not videos, photos. Have a look at this one. Okay, this is from a, uh, if anyone here is a medical doctor, anyone doctor, 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 nobody's a doctor. Cool, I'm also not a doctor, don't worry. So, <laughs> right. This is a case of something, can you guess what is this? Yes, you're saying something. This is actually paralysis, also called hathi pao. Can you hear me at the, at the back? I have to be on the mic. Can you give me a mobile mic? Really much better, huh? I can point it out. Yeah, wonderful, thank you. Working? Right. Okay, wonderful. Yeah, this really helps. Okay, I'll just try to change the slide. Yeah, so this is a case of something called philaresis uh, or hathi bao or, or um, elephant feet, elephantitis. You might have uh, read about it in your uh, school days, elephantitis, philaresis. And this is a this is a particular case from which we sought in uh, in uh, near Mughal Sarai, but not in Uttar Pradesh, but in Bihar, which is uh, Western Bihar. So this is the Western Bihar case, uh, and this is a whole village which is called Hathi Pao Gaon. Right? What a name to have. Right? Somebody was telling me Snapdeal village the other day. But this is this Gaon was used to be called, not anymore. It used to be called Hathi Pao Gaon. And you will got tons and tons of cases of philaresis there. Tons and tons. And this is a case of a level 4 philaresis, which means, so what happens in philaresis is that uh, your, your body... Uh, so th there is this blood which goes your body up and down and there's something called lymph, lymph, L-Y-M-P-H. Uh, it goes up and down your body and there are these lymph v valves, you know, these valves which kind of push it back up. So unlike the heart which pumps blood, lymph travels by these valves, you know, who like pump, 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 pump upwards, downwards like that, downwards the gravity. So it, it pumps upwards like that. So what happens in philaresis is that your lymph valves in your feet stop working. Which means that the lymph starts swelling in your feet, the the, the lymph liquid. So uh, the the feet start swelling, and this is what leads to philaresis. It's it's a it's a perfectly curable condition. It does not require more than a month of medication. It's more harmless than a tuberculosis. But this is a case of untreated philaresis. Now, what happens if if for this guy this would have swollen and the skin would have got so heavy that it fell over? It, it like fell over, like you know, so it, it, it ballooned and then it fell over. And then it kept falling over three times. So this is a level four philaresis where the skin has overlapped four times. And because the skin overlaps and this guy loses sensation, does not clean his feet, what happens is this fungus, this fungi developing in his feet. You can see those, this is really gruesome, no? this one, this fungi. Now, this man is going to lose his feet. If this goes on, he's going to lose. It's going to lead to is going to lead to gangrene. And he's going to lose his feet, and this happens for something which can be cured for less than two hundred rupees, even if you go to a private hospital, and for free if you go to a government hospital. For something which requires very small tablets at a very small time frame, maybe a month. That's all. But this man would have developed this condition over four years. Four years, this condition developed slowly, immobilized him. He cannot walk. He's obviously in some pain. And he's losing his limbs. And this is a whole gao. And the gao is not just one village. There are like multiple villages where you find Hathi Pao gaons. So it's like, it's, it's just a concept, you know. So there's multiple uh, areas where you'll find this philaresis cases. And in the same village, you'll find... Uh, this, this, uh, this, this guy is called Bodhana. A very nice guy. I'll tell you the story. But this guy... Uh, so this person, and this is about... This is again a before picture. And this is a case of... Uh, in children, when leprosy happens, and this is leprosy, you know leprosy, how many of you know leprosy? Leprosy, leprosy, kushtarok. 
So leprosy is something which starts distorting. Uh, so it, it, you st one starts losing sensation and also in children it starts distorting the bones. So in this case what has happened, his hand is backward, like it's, it's backward, it goes the other way. So he cannot hold a pen. So it will not happen like this. It will be always like this, it's stiff. It can move a bit back but he cannot hold a pen. And this is a condition where this guy, this little child will be out of school. He cannot hold a pencil. He cannot do anything actually. And the hands are stiffening. Soon the whole arm will stiffen. So the arm will be like this only. And then he start losing, you know. He will start losing part by part. And this is also curable. Perfectly curable. It's, it's only very marginally infective. So even if you live with a person with leprosy, nothing happens. Most of the times. Mother Teresa lived with a whole bunch of people with leprosy. And it's perfectly curable. But the problem was that no doctor could reach that village. Bihar is a problem of floods. Like floods and droughts, floods and droughts. So every time you build a road, the flood washes them off. And plus there's no connectivity. There's no connection. There is something which we call physical connection is missing. So we started doing this. So And led by this child, by the way, this is the uh, local village hero, if you can call him. The, the, the great leader who's... who's championed a transformation of his own village where all what we started was they started taking photographs taking it back to urban areas which is not very far away must be like 3 hours of journey over a bus go back and then started running uh, a sort of a philanthropic kind of a bus model where, the, where a bus full of doctors would come back tell the uh, local population about their problems the local population will tell the doctors about their problems and then, then treat them at that level and the most acute cases using that same bus which brings in the doctors would go back to the urban areas. So just by opening something called physical connectivity and led by a little kid who is not more than 12 years of age called Budna, uh, we started in transforming that whole Hathi Pao Gaon. And there are a bunch of NGOs who work there who, and now none of these cases are there. You don't see leprosy there, you don't see paralysis there at all. So that's how physical connectivity is transforming the Budnas of Bihar, of India of Gujarat perhaps, of many other places and perhaps the world. This girl is called Samosi. Can you guess what is Samosi's favorite snack? Samosa. Right. So, Samosi, uh, her story is that she's about 8 years old and she uh, she's from a place called Dharwad. Actually, a place called Kalkeri in Dharwad which is a little gao in Dharwad and uh, and what Samosi uh, Samosi and many other Samosas and Imartis and Barfis uh, of that area they are, they are all basically children who are either orphans or children who have one parent missing or children who have been abandoned by their own parents and they are all that bunch of people and there is this person called uh, a great friend this guy this guy Matthew, uh, Matthew, uh, Matthew Ferrier. Now Matthew is, uh, is, uh, is, is a French and uh, with he and his friend Adam, uh, both of them, and that's me, uh, yeah, <laughs> so uh, right in the center. So uh, what, what, uh, what they did was that uh, they came in 1990s to India and they, love and fell, uh, they, they fell in love with uh, something called the Hindustani music. And then they went to Banaras and Banaras has this thing that whoever comes to Banaras as a foreigner does not go back. Very dangerous place to go. <laughs> so uh, so he, he did not go back. And then he, he said, I'm going to devote my life to Hindustani music. So what he did was that he picked up this little place on the top of a hill in a tribal area. In an absolute tribal area. In a place called Dharwad in northern Karnataka. This place is called Kalkeri Sangeet Vidyalaya. And he picks up these children who are orphans all around the place, all around northern Karnataka. And he picks them for one thing, musical talent. If I spot a child singing, and if I can convince his parents to send him to me, or the, his parents are not there, which is a very frequent case, or an abandoned child, I will take them. And he runs complete free education. Uh, it's a school, which operates as a school, as a normal school. And in the evening, there is there's a Sangeet Vidyalaya which takes over. 
So the, all the children sit in the courtyard and they'll be playing all kinds of instruments. Somebody's playing a piano, somebody's playing a, 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 a tabla, and somebody's got multiple talents. And this girl, Samosi, plays violin. And violin, by the way, is the most difficult instrument to play because you can't even see it. The grand thing is like this. So you can't see it. And it's, it's almost half the height of the girl itself. So she has to actually place a table in front of her to rest the violin because the violin is too heavy for her. But she plays violin. How many of you play? How many of you play anything? I'm not going to ask you to play. <laughs> okay, one person like marginal, half play. <laughs> okay, one more, late, late entry. Okay, great, so two or three of you. Anyone plays violin of, of you? Any, any, do you play violin? Do you play violin? You play violin. Half violin. <laughs> so yeah, so the violin is a very difficult instrument to play. And you've got these eight-year-old kids, many of them, who play violin. So when uh, Dr. Kalam went there to a local college over there, so he can't, there's no way we can travel up the hill. It's almost a trek. So cars can't go. <sighs> Very difficulty. They can go, but not a whole motorcade. So uh, what we did was that we asked all these children to actually set up a one-hour performance. I can show you the video, but there's no time. It's a beautiful performance. It's one of the best performances I've seen. And you know how these kids get educated? They get educated over something called Skype. How many of you know Skype? Everybody knows Skype. Awesome. So what happens is that there's this little uh, electronic room. Uh, it's it's uh, well, it's not as lavish as this room. Maybe half of, or maybe even less than half of this room, uh, with a with a much smaller screen, which is which is just a sari. And then there's a projector, and then there's this uh, this your, what do you call a, a DTH kind of a network, which which is like a satellite, which transmits data at 3G speeds, and you can volunteer time. So if you know violin and if you want to teach a kid right in the rural areas of Dharwad uh, on teaching, uh, on learn, on how to play violin, you can devote, you can share time. So you can share your musical talent. And 50% of the education of the musical education part of these kids happen over Skype, over virtual world. And that's how they learn. And then of course there are a bunch of volunteers who stay with them, like Matthew, like Adam, like many others. But that's how, that's how the, the ability to transmit data over geographies half a world away in half a second has given us the ability to transform people who we'll never meet in person, never ever meet. And it is a brilliant power to have. But with great power, as Batman says, comes great expectations and responsibilities. So, this is how Electronic connectivity is transforming the samosis and the imartis and the barfis and the name a snack of this world. Now, uh, this person is called Ram Avatar, uh, and this is a shot uh, from a Chitrakoot Pura complex in uh, northern Madhya Pradesh. It's, it's, it's at the border of Uttar Pradesh and, Bih uh, of Ma Uttar Pradesh and Madhya Pradesh. Chitrakoot, if you are well versed with Ramayan, has a lot of religious significance because Lord Ram spent some time there uh, while he was, uh, you know, uh, what do you call it? Vanvas, right? So, so that's it's highly significant in that sense. Uh, and this is a so one challenge which uh, which we faced, uh, which as a country we still face, uh, while we talk about development and improving the farm and improving the farm practices and productivity and using better fertilizers and pesticides and blah blah blah, is the fact that uh, farmers do not adapt to it. Farmers do not take it up. And the reason is because what is taught in a classroom condition is very different from a field condition. So we said, we're going to change this. We're going to change this right at its mouth. So what we did was that instead of asking farmers to come to class, we took the class to the farmer. So we said, we're going to establish a class right in the middle of the village. And many, many villages actually. So there, there are many of these little, little centers, extension centers, which were right in the middle of villages. And we said, here's this... So in this case, uh, I'll show you this board. Right, so we said, we're going to establish, uh, you can't see, so I'll just read it off. This one says, one and a half acre model, acres, one and a half acre. One acre is about 40% of an hectare. Okay. So one, of, one and a half acre farm. So this, this whole farm is, is actually one and a half hectare. And there's another one, this one, uh, the, the, the right one, which is not visible in this picture, which is two and a half acres. So it's only a one and a half acre farm and a two and a half acre farm. This one is to support a family of six and this one a family of eight, I think. And then we said how you can use 
this farm. So you come as an intern, like you guys go on internships. You come as an intern, you spend a season there, six months. You grow, whatever you grow, you take it. But by that, what happened was that farmers started seeing that if I can do it in the land right next to my house, why can't I do this in my own land? And that's how adaption started taking up. Right. And that's how, you know, one very beautiful thing which was written in the first slide which Madam was talking about when she was talking, it was there. Uh, it read uh, local context. That's the motto of your university. Local context. Or something called local. Somebody calls it local. Some, I think Thomas Friedman talk about it. But context is important. And knowledge has to be customized according to context. According to local linguistics, according to, in this case, local agroclimatics, local land holding patterns, local, local products which grow, people which they know, local markets, what they buy, what they eat, because half of the time farmers eat of what the sustainability farming, right? Sustenance farming, as you call it. So you have to actually suit to the local context. And that's how knowledge revolution begins. Knowledge has to be customized according to people. And people have to be shown things hands on. And that's how transformation begins. And today, the Chitrakut Pura complex is the most successful Pura complex in India. And I would say it's the most successful, perhaps, rural development, a single rural development model in the world. It is catering to over 800, 750 something villages, which is about, if you calculate each village is about 2,000 people, that would be about, about one and a half million people. One and a half million people, that's about, about, one fourth the population of this city are being benefited by one ideology, by one fabric. And sad part is we don't hear about these beautiful stories because we are obsessed with uh, urban knowledge. It's sad. I mean, it's really. I find very sad when media does not talk about rural India at all. Where 70% people of this country live and where food comes, where this wood comes, where half of the products which we are sitting on comes, we don't talk about it. In fact, and just to take a bit of a detour, if you allow me, uh, two years back, there was something called a Lakme India Fashion Week in Hayat Hotel in Mumbai. In Hayat Hotel, 540 odd journalists were covering in a room which was maybe four times the size of, five times the size of this room, all crammed up somehow. You know, somehow. And they were covering on how models are going to walk on ramps with fancy uniform, uh, fancy dresses, not uniforms, dresses. Okay. 500 plus journalists. 300 miles to the east lay a place called Vidarbh. 300 east of Mumbai was a place called Vidarbh. Where every, every minute or every hour, two farmers were committing suicide. Every minute. Every every hour, two farmers were committing suicide. The same farmers who were growing the cotton which these models were wearing, and that was being covered by four journalists. Four. I can name them. Four journalists were covering perhaps a 10,000th suicide of Indian farmer, while 540 were, would be covering the Hath Hotel and how these models are going to wear the same cotton which these farmers will produce. So sometimes we don't hear about rural India at all. And this is a success story. So it's even worse. Rural plus good story, don't talk. Bad story, yeah, maybe. So uh, this is a beautiful place. If any of you wants to visit, you should visit. So this is how Better Knowledge Connectivity is helping Ram Avtas manage their little farms and little families and little hopes better. And this one is my personal favorite. Uh, I, I, uh, so... For some reason, we have to change the names of this girl. So let's call them Sarita. Let's call them Sarita and Vinita. The one in purple is Vinita. The one in yellow is Sarita. It's purple, right? Somebody once corrected some some weird mauve color or something, whatever it is. So for me, it's purple. This is purple, and this is yellow. So the the Sarita, that's this will be Sarita and this will be Vinita. All right. So there's a discussion on the colors. <laughs> Are we at a conclusion? <laughs> it's mauve. No. It's pink. Oh, it's pink. So the new order is pink. Somebody said some other color. Anyway, so whatever it is, you get it, right? So Sarita and Vinita. 
let's put it this way. So, uh, uh, so we were in a place called Kolhapur, uh, again in Maharashtra, uh, where this beautiful uh, Pura complex used to run. Uh, and this is a little uh, story, it will take a while to absorb, but you have to pay attention to me. This is a tribal place again. It's near Kolhapur, it's on the hills. And uh, so I, w I was there as just finding out what is the impact of what we are trying to do. Very cool, very happy about it. And on comes a girl. On comes a girl uh, which would have been 18. Uh, none of you would be 18. So what you were two years back perhaps. And it's, it would be about half an hour or maybe a, more than half an hour, about, about an hour of drive into all kinds of terrain. So we went this, to this place. This, this, this is a temple area of that place. And, and on comes a bunch of, must be about 25 women. 25 women, none of them above 18. All less than 18 years of age, these women are operating. This is a daycare center. And this is actually not just a daycare center. It also backs up as a night shelter. So all these women live there. And all these women live there with their children. Right? And the story is like this. The story is, in this case, all these women were tribal women who lived in the top of the hills. And top of the hills, tribal is the most poorest segment. They, in their 12, 13 years of age, were married off to people who lived at the valleys, the bottom of the, uh, the, the mountains, who were the richer people, the richer guys. And these rich guys were, in this case, truck drivers. And truck drivers, incidentally, is the highest HIV-positive community in India highest incidence of human, you know, HIV, right? The vi virus which leads to AIDS. So, they were married to these men who were perhaps twice, thrice their age, might, might be even four times in some cases, a girl getting married at 12 to a man at 45, about four times the age, often as their second, third, fourth wife, which is technically called a keep and not a wife. And what happened was that they contracted the HIV virus from their husbands. The husbands were AIDS patients already, so they had you know, gone to that higher level of HIV infection, which is called AIDS, where a person doesn't live beyond certain years. They died. And these husbands died, and the wives were left, uh, well, for all practical purposes, widow, but technically not even a widow, because the marriage is not legal. So these women, with often one children by them or two children with them or perhaps even worse having a child with them and a child inside them were out on the streets without their husbands as illegal wives as illegal widows all, almost and and there's no way they can go back because that's not a culture nobody goes back to their families no 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 you can't go back that's not done and their in-laws will not keep them because they were called something called a mataka prakop which means you are a curse you are a curse which led to the death of my son so you can't live with us so get lost. Get lost at the age of 16 out in the streets with two children to take care of. Or worse, pregnant and taking another child with you to take care of. At the age of 16, what were you doing? At the age of 16, 17, we were playing, well, I was playing Super Mario and Contra. Maybe you were playing Facebook Farmville or something. At that age, reality hits you. Hits you like a truck in the night. And India is a country which runs the largest, world's largest anti-retrovirus scheme, ARVs. It's free. But these women being illegal widows and hence considered immoral were denied initially their right to free drugs. So they got together and they started little economic ventures, making papal, making, making a, what do you call it, chaklis and, and all kinds of food products which could be stored because of one very nice guy who operates retail chains over in that part of the world could actually be stored next to a Hindustan lever product so that people can pick this and pick that as well. Typically as you see in Ahmedabad, you know, in the last mile sale the, the, or the last meter sale of a shopping mall, which is something which you will hear about if you haven't heard about in retail management class, you will hear about this last meter sale. And that is the product where they started selling. Chaklis, papads, little stuff. And then using that economic might, they got together. They formed self-help groups. They formed a cooperative, which is the largest self-help group of about these 25 women. And they protested for their rights, their legal rightful share of ARVs, antiretrovirus drugs. They got it. And they had to do a lot of papal belna, literally, to get that. And then they started this daycare center. 
And this daycare center is where they operate their economic activities and they also take care of their children. So, these little two beautiful girls who we are going to call Sarita and Vinita, this one, the pink one or the purple one, is extremely talkative. Keeps talking. Ask any question and she'll, before you ask, say the question fully, she'll come up with an answer. And when you meet a bunch of kids, what is the first question you ask? The first question you ask when you meet a bunch of kids is, Bade hoge kya hoge? When you grow up, what will you like to become? Bade hoge kya hoge? And it just happens, like impulsive. You meet a bunch of kids, Bade hoge kya hoge? Turant. It's only after saying that I realize the mistake in asking that question perhaps. Because most of these kids, uh, most of these kids are actually HIV positive. Most of them are. But I don't want to get into despair part of the story. I want to get into the part of the hope. Because the hope part of the story starts when this little talkative girl who answers questions before they are asked, immediately, I'll tell you, I'll tell you, I'll tell you. And she says, and she's seven, eight. I don't know her exact age, but looks like seven, eight. She's definitely not probably going to call, cross 12. But at seven, she gets up and says, When I grow up, I will a doctor. Why? Because I have told my mother all my life. All my life means seven years. Seven years. You understand Hindi, right? It Anybody does not understand Hindi at all? So, we could have had this agreement before we started. So, yeah. When I grow up, I will become a doctor. And that's why, because I have been doing this all my life, and I have been doing this all my life. In seven years, I have seen my mother in my life. I have seen my mother in my life. I have to do this. And that is the level of sensitivity which this little girl brings in on the table. And then, and then one asks, what can I do for this? What can we do? I wish, I hope, I pray that someday this Sarita and the other girl as well, both of them become great doctors and find perhaps the cure for HIV itself. But that's the little engine of making local competencies into economic activities which their mothers in despair decided to take up is now yielding this beautiful unraveling of an impossible dream. And dreams are always impossible and should be. And that's how what we call as economic connectivity is making Sarita and Vinita realize, I hope so, their potential. This, my friends, is something which is called Pura. All four. You heard about, I'm not going to talk about this, yeah. So, physical connectivity, electronic connectivity, knowledge connectivity, and economic connectivity. Physical, electronic, knowledge, economic. And that's what we do. We pick up villages about 40-50 in size, 40-50 villages together, uh, something which they share as an economic competency. We build economic models, income generation models around them. We, we go back and find out to realize economic potential, uh, what kind of knowledge connectivity one needs to create, what knowledge products one needs to create, and what kind of electronic bridgeways one has to use, which can be mobile phones. I mean, uh, in, in another five years, there'll be more mobile phone users in rural areas than urban areas. So let's use them. So we find those out, and then we find out, oh, what, uh, what is the kind of road network we need? What kind of buses we need to run? What kind of train stops we need to create? What is the goods movement we need to create? All those physical assets which we need to have. And then using a cultural environment around it, one has to not destroy that culture, that's very important. We start creating something which we call providing urban amenities in rural areas. And this 50-50-50, 50 villages ka jo concept hai, it was later picked up in 2012 by the government of India, by the government of Karnataka and many other governments. In fact, Gujarat government is doing something called Rarban, which is based on the same model. And uh, the, the government of India is doing it across nine states where the, uh, the thrust in 13 years uh, using private-public partnership this 50-50 model of villages is going to come up and create all these things which we talked about. Private sector is doing it. A lot of NGOs are getting up. Uh, your institute can do it. Just pick up a village. There's so many villages within Ahmedabad which lack basic amenities, basic amenities of sanitation. Ba and they lack the basic ability uh, and the knowledge to tap into what 
as a potential they have as young managers can you take up that task can you take up the task of actually uh, you know going out to these villages and finding out what you can do as a manager for them and that will be the best management contribution you can make what's the time how much time do i have six okay so i need to finish ah, so the professor says finish one hour has passed right great and this is a little picture which we have um, can you recognize the man on the left ah that's that's him and behind him is his uh, press secretary mr khan you don't know him the person who's probably translating for him a bit and these women are the ones who operate uh, um, uh, this is in chitrakoot so these are these are women who operate a lot of self help groups in chitrakoot so he's having a uh, lunch a very nice lunch actually so, uh, with all these women and understanding their their model of development and these women talk with great pride on what they have done it's wonderful right so great one hour has passed in one hour i wanted to quickly and the reason i asked you to check time was this in 60 minutes i want to quickly tell you what happened in the world i'm not going to log on to google i'm going to tell you what happened in the world while we talked while we had this beautiful conversation and you were very kind to be so attentive all across the world 15000 children were born about 6 and a half thousand people died which meant that in the global population we added about 8500 people in one hour in one every single hour we add 8 and a half thousand people to the global population and while we talked about 4 million kilograms of carbon dioxide was added by human activities by burning fossil fuels by industrial production by cutting down resources by deforestation about 4 million kilograms of carbon dioxide was added to the environment well to offset that to change that to convert that carbon dioxide into back into oxygen in one year we would need to plant this hour this very hour we should have planted around 2 lakh trees but in effect what we ended up doing was in this one hour we have cut down 24000 of them so while we needed to plant 2 lakhs we actually ended up cutting 24000 and while we discussed all this stuff somebody i hope none of you yet in this one hour at least a bunch of people around the world would have spent 45000 dollars on buying virtual agricultural equipments and e seeds electronic seeds on farmville you know farmville how many people play farmville come on let's be honest how many people play farmville who does not why <laughs> okay no <laughs> anyway so yeah, good so 45000 dollars would have been spent in one hour by global population on farmville and this is a little more than half of what the indian government would have spent in this one hour in actually improving agricultural sciences about 85000 dollars would have been spent by the indian government on improving the agricultural sciences through the icar initiative so more than half of that real world science more than half of that amount is actually being spent on a virtual world and while all this is happening somewhere in vidarb two farmers would have committed suicide every hour two farmers would commit suicide and while we kept on discussing and discussing by rich people giving to poor countries grants the osaids and the usaids and the the foundations of this world about 22 million dollars would have passed on from the rich people of this world to the poorest people of this world at the same time because of the fact that the poor people are in debt and have to pay interest they would have ended up paying 10 times that amount back to the rich people of this world so they would have paid back 220 million dollars back to the rich countries of this world countries like zaire actually 40% of the gdp goes back in just paying interest on loans which are 25 years old 
for every dollar of loan which Africa gets, 1.2 dollars of interest has to be paid back every year. 120% interest effectively. And while we do all this, while we all discussed, 70 million glasses of Coca-Cola would have been served across the world. 70 million glasses, it's a huge amount in one hour. And while those 70 million glasses were, di were being distributed and enjoyed with all khushiyon and all, kya wo, the, all the slogans which come, khushiyon ki asha, umeedon ki dhoop and all that stuff. While 70 million glasses of Coca-Cola would have reached and out of those 70 million glasses, one-fourth went to the third world countries. The third world countries and the emerging economy, so people like us and Africa. About a third of them, about a fourth of them would have gone to us. 70 million glasses of Coca-Cola would have been served across the world in the, in, in, while we discussed in one hour. And while all that happened, 60 children would have gone permanently blind, permanently blind, so permanently blind because they could not get glasses. Glasses. Chashme. 60 children would go blind in one hour. Every minute, one child. Out of these 60 children, 36 of them will die within this year. When a child goes blind in third world country, 60% of the times they die in one year. One year, flat. It's a race to death. So out of the 60 children, 36 will die this year. And half of them will die in Cambodia, Afghanistan and Vietnam by stepping on landmines. One million children have been maimed or killed since 1975 by stepping on landmines laid by Western powers in their wars, Iraq-Iran border, Cambodia, Vietnam, now Afghanistan. So, 60 children will go blind in one hour, in this one hour, 36 will die in this year, out of these 60, and half of these deaths will be because these children will play in all their blindness and step onto a landmine. And while we keep on discussing, 270 user, 270,000 users would have played and crossed a level of Candy Crush. Everybody plays Candy Crush. The candies, you know, this rich source of glucose. 270,000 users in one hour, in the past one hour, would have crossed a level of Candy Crush. And while this happened, 23,000 children under the age of 5 would have been permanently stunted or wasted due to lack of food. Because of malnutrition, 23,000 children in this one hour which we talked, 23,000 children is a huge amount. It's perhaps more than the strength of an entire university in one hour would have gone permanently crippled, permanently stunted, permanently mentally handicapped or permanently wasted, which is the worst form of stunting in this one hour. And 30% of these 23,000 children would be in our country, in this one country. India contributes more to wasted children than any other country in the world. So 23,000 30% is about 7,000 people. 7,000 Indian kids would have been wasted. 23,000 internationally. Maybe those candies, if they were real and they were with nutrition, they could have saved these 23,000 kids. And what can I do? Maybe that's the question you need to ask. Question to ask is, what can I do? We've been gifted with... Can I switch on this mic? Yeah. Oh, my hand is painting. Yeah. You know, uh, we are gifted people. We've been gifted with education. We've been gifted with wealth. Sometimes of our parents' wealth. We've been gifted with high birth. We've been gifted with with something which is most important, opportunity. Opportunity is the biggest gift we've got. So we are gifted people, very highly gifted people. And in, 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 we are actually an island of hope in a sea of despair. And with that gift comes great expectations. And with the kind of gifts we have, any amount, there's no limit to the kind of expectations the world can levy upon us. When you go out, and I, I have expectations from you right now. Not even you need to. You don't even need to go out. You have to do something now. 
and something will go here. Start sooner. Start now. Will help you contribute longer. Create an impact over a longer period in time. This, if you ask me, when do I change? When do I start changing this world? Now. Right now. And that doesn't mean that you need to, you know, leave your jobs and don't take up career and stop studying everything else and start becoming a social worker. No, not that, that's not the point at all. We need efficient people in efficient business models to change the inequities of this world. I hope that maybe 30 years from now, 20 years from now, you will stand where I am standing. Maybe 10 years from now, you will stand right here. And you will have a bunch of fresh grads in front of you looking into your eyes. And you would be able to establish your image not just for your professional competence, not just for your professional accomplishments, not just for the big fat jobs which you have created. Of course you would have. That's wonderful. But also, you would have done well in taking the world's worst inequities and contributed in the lives of people half a world away, people living in a completely different world, people living, people who will not ever see, people who you'll never know the names of, those unnamed people. You would fare well in doing something in the lives of those people. In those people with whom your only connection would be humanity. Patanjali Yoga Sutra some 2005 years, 100 years ago says when you are inspired by some great purpose some extraordinary project great purpose, extraordinary project all your thoughts break their bounds your mind transcends limitations. Your consciousness expands in every direction. Every direction. And you find yourself in a new, great and wonderful world. The world changes around you actually. Dormant forces, dormant forces, the ones which were sleeping so far, those forces within you. Faculties and talents come alive. And you discover yourself to be a greater person by far, by far, than you ever dreamt yourself to be. If you want to be that extraordinary person, if you want to lock all your beholden talents and your great faculties, then what you need to do is start dreaming big, start picking up great purposes and extraordinary projects. With those words, I come to a close, which I hope is the beginning for you and I hope you great, do great in your professional world, in your educational ventures. I hope you take care of your parents, your teachers, you remember them. I hope whatever you do in your life further up, you remember that there was a mother, a teacher and a motherland which did a lot for what you have achieved and I hope you remember that unknown man who lives in a different world who can change his life if you could devote your professional competence and your intelligence and your talent to change it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. After such a thought-invoking address from sir, I now request Professor Chirag Trivedi to render a vote of thanks. Good evening, everybody. Uh, for this year's BKMIBA annual lecture, we were very clear about two things. We wanted it to be a lecture, an annual lecture, which would engage students' mind for about 60, 70 minutes and not just a talk for 20, 30 minutes. And we wanted someone like Shrijan, a young mind, to interact with young minds using their language and appealing to their thinking and cognition processes. First of all, I thank you, Shrijan. Thanks a lot that you have left all of us in the audience with so many ideas, disturbance, questions, hope, and a sense of determination and commitment, I'm sure, has started taking shape. Thank you so much for doing that in 
the sense that we know the jargon that we understand and the ideas and examples that we easily relate with i also thank all our senior ahmedabad university members principals of the sister institutes faculty members of ahmedabad university for coming to encourage us please keep doing so again and again i thank every member in the audience all the students who have so attentively listen to shrijan make sure that you all whatever one little thing a few things that have caused a trigger in your mind you all will work on it and you all will definitely try and do something to one of those things that we have come to know about today thank you all thank you sir and thank you sir for being here it was a truly an honor and i i thank everyone in the audience uh, for being so patient and i hope everyone will be benefited from this lecture i request everyone to join us out for refreshments and uh, students please note that uh, the beyond syllabus attendance will be given uh, on the second floor uh, classes thank you all